Well, I'm back. Thanks to the algorithm suddenly giving the first video a massive boost, I can see that we aren't even close to being done with our exploration here. Not that I ever thought we were. There's still at least 80% left to see, and a lot of other things I got wrong. I thought I was knowledgeable enough on this subject, but now I see that you guys are the real seamen here. You guys left a lot of suggestions for a part two, so that's what we're going to get into today. Just to put into perspective how dumb I actually am, you want to know how far I got in the first video without getting something wrong? 16 seconds. Not even half a minute into the video, and I already messed up because I said, You know what else is creepy, deep and obscure? The ocean. The place where icebergs come from. And as this user pointed out, icebergs don't come from the ocean, they come from glaciers. My first public video where I actually speak, and I've already been destroyed by facts and logic. So in this video, I'm going to be correcting and expanding on things from the previous video as well as talking about some new subjects. So I'd recommend watching that video first. Also, a quick disclaimer. Just because something is in this video doesn't mean that it's 100% real, or that I personally believe in it. But with that out of the way, let's just get into it. Loneliest Whale slash 52 Hertz Whale so this was something that I meant to talk about in the first video, but then I just forgot to. I included it in the script and even recorded it, but then I just didn't put it in the video until it was too late. Oh well. But anyway, the 52 Hertz whale refers to an unusual whale call. Like the name states, the frequency of the call was 52 Hertz. Which is peculiar because other whales usually vocalize at a frequency of 10 to 39 Hertz meaning that this whale can't even be heard by other whales. Its call was first discovered in 1989, and has been recorded multiple times every year. It's usually recorded in the Gulf of Alaska between the months of August and February, further solidifying that this call belongs to a whale. Because this whale has never been observed and was the only detected source of its call, it's been nicknamed the loneliest whale in the world. But there is evidence that there may be more than one whale making this call. Scientists at first believe the unusual frequency of its call may be a symptom of deafness and not evidence of a new whale species. But new evidence suggests it's possible that the calls originated from a newly discovered hybrid of blue whale and fin whale. There's even a documentary about it if you'd like to go more in depth with this topic. Atlantis is a metaphor. Plato's original story about Atlantis was meant to be an allegory on the hubris of nations. In the story, Athens represents a perfect society that the Atlanteans failed to overtake due to their overconfidence. At one point, Atlantis was as great as Athens, but because of that, its people became greedy and arrogant, leading to their punishment from the gods. Not a whole lot to talk about here, but a few people wanted me to mention this as it does serve as further evidence of Atlantis being fictional. Columbus Bermuda Triangle During Christopher Columbus's voyage to the New World, he passed through the Bermuda Triangle, and of course he and his crew reported a few strange things that they saw. For starters, Columbus wrote that he saw three mermaids and described them as not half as beautiful as they are painted. This is because in actuality what he saw were three manatees. Another thing that was reported was a great flame of fire crashing into the sea one night, which was most likely a meteor and they also saw a strange light that appeared in the distance. Columbus also wrote about how his compass was off while passing through the triangle, adding some proof to the agonic line theory that I talked about in part one. Also clearing something up about the agonic line is that it has more to do with true north on a map rather than magnetism. It isn't really the unexplainable anomaly that I may have made it seem like in part one. It could still throw off your navigation if you forget to account for the small variation created by it, but it isn't really a catch-all explanation for these ship disappearances. Maybe a few of the older ones, but it's more likely that most of them were sunk by rogue waves or something. Mariana Trench Megalodon There is supposed footage of a massive shark swimming in the Mariana Trench. People took this as evidence that megalodons still exist and just migrated downwards into deeper waters, which is why we've never seen them. If the giant squid could do it, why not the megalodon, right? Well, not really. 
The shark in the footage was more than likely a sleeper shark. In fact, most reported megalodon sightings are simply just other known shark species that people mistake for megalodons because people underestimate just how large modern sharks can get. And as it turns out, Pacific sleeper sharks can grow to be 23 feet or 7 meters long. So yeah, the shark in the footage is most definitely a sleeper shark. Also, it's impossible for megalodons to live in the Mariana Trench, as megalodons were warm water creatures, and the deep ocean is way too cold for them to survive. There's also nothing big or numerous enough down there to sustain a species as large as the megalodon, and if there were, we probably would have noticed by now. Colossal Squid In the last video, I brought up giant squids as a real-life equivalent to the kraken. But what if I told you there is another species of squid that's not quite as big, but just as interesting? This is the colossal squid, and they can grow to be as large as 33 feet. For comparison, the giant squid can be 43 feet long, thanks to their longer tentacles. The colossal squid also has the largest eyes of any known creature to exist, with a diameter up to 16 inches or 40 centimeters. They also have sharp hooks inside the suction cups on its arms and tentacles, used to grip the flesh of its prey as it tears into them with its beak. They are presumed to be ambush predators, and are known to use bioluminescence to attract their prey. Deep Sea Gigantism Deep Sea Gigantism is pretty much exactly as it sounds. It's the tendency for deep sea animals to grow to much larger sizes than their relatives in shallow water. See the giant and colossal squids compared to every other squid. Other good examples are the giant tube worm, oarfish, Japanese spider crab, and giant isopod. There are some theories as to why deep sea animals grow so large. For one, bigger animals are generally more efficient. A larger fish will have a greater metabolism than a smaller fish, and in the empty abyssal areas of the ocean, where an animal has to travel miles and miles for its next meal, being more efficient can be vital to survival. Another possible factor is that larger size could be an adaptation to the colder temperatures of the deep sea, as large animals are better at withstanding cold environments. Whale Falls When a whale dies, its carcass will often sink down and land on the sea floor. When this happens, they practically become a new ecosystem, rejuvenating the wildlife in the area as deep water organisms flock to them to feed off the bounty of nutrients that they provide. These whale falls can support communities for months or even decades as the whale skeleton can act as a surface for invertebrate colonization, providing support and energy to single-celled organisms and sponges. These are really cool. Morbid, but cool. Milky Sea Phenomenon is used to deflect predators. A few people pointed out that the bioluminescence given off by the bacteria that causes Milky Sea Phenomenon could be to ward off predators. This seems like a likely theory as to why these microorganisms light up. They could also be lighting up to warn others of a potential danger, or even to attract mates. Scientists also believe that the bioluminescence of these bacteria could be a side product of their metabolism under certain conditions, such as low oxygen concentration. But the specific biological role for bioluminescent bacteria still remains unclear. No Sea Beluga Whale In the 1960s and 70s, the US Navy had been using whales and dolphins for tasks like mine detection and recovering test torpedoes. One of these whales was a beluga whale named No Sea. No Sea spent his entire life in captivity working alongside human trainers and died in 1999. But in 2012, an audio recording of Nosy would surface in a research paper called Spontaneous Human Speech and Mimicry by a Cetacean. The audio recording sounds unusual for a beluga, and it seems like he's trying to mimic human vocal patterns. In 1984, people began hearing strange noises coming from the whale's enclosure that sounded like two people conversing. They later put together that it was Nosy, and they decided to record his vocalizations. This isn't actually all that uncommon. Beluga whales have been called the canaries of the sea because of how much they try to mimic sounds. But this was the first time this phenomenon was ever recorded. 
Orcas are also capable of the same mimicry. She may not win any prizes for diction, but this teenage killer whale is certainly impressing scientists. They say she's the first of her kind to be heard copying human speech. Hello? Hello? It's not quite on the same level of mimicry as parrots or whatever, but it does demonstrate the incredible learning capacity that these whales possess. Loop at original speed. This was something that a few people pointed out to me, but the bloop sound, when played at its original speed, further proves that it's an ice quake, as it sounds almost nothing like a creature. While we're at it, we might as well listen to what other unidentified sounds sound like at their original speed. We should also talk about some other unidentified sounds that I didn't cover last time. Slow Down was a sound recorded on May 19, 1997 in the Pacific Ocean. A couple facts about it is that it has been picked up several times each year since its discovery, and is named Slow Down because of how the sound slowly decreases in frequency. The next sound we're going to look at is Train a sound recorded on March 5th, 1997 near Cape Adair. Notice any pattern? Yeah, pretty much all these sounds were discovered when NOAA was researching low-frequency sounds in the southern regions of the Pacific, fairly close to the Antarctic. So I think it's safe to say that these sounds were all caused by some form of glacial activity. Sphinx Water Erosion the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis is a fringe theory that the Great Sphinx of Giza eroded due to ancient floods and or rainfalls. This theory was proposed in the 1950s by French mystic and alternative Egyptologist R. A. Schwaller de Lubix. Later in 1979, this theory would be picked up by John Anthony West, who further claimed that the Sphinx was created around 10,000 BC aligning it with the sinking of Atlantis, and that the Sphinx itself was created by Atlantean colonists. Believe it or not, there is some evidence for this. The Sphinx being eroded by water, anyway. There are erosional features on the Sphinx that are believed by Dr. Robert Schock to have been caused by water runoff. Schock's hypothesis suggests that the Sphinx is much older than conventionally believed, and that the Sphinx dates back to a time where rainfall was more common. However, many geologists disagree and say that these erosional features were caused by wind, and West's ideas have been criticized for being influenced by his already existing beliefs, and the idea that the Sphinx was also built by Atlanteans only for it to be submerged seems to be another example of his confirmation bias. Google Earth Anomalies and Shipwrecks There are a handful of shipwrecks and strange things in the ocean that can be seen on Google Earth. For example, there's this shipwreck that was previously undocumented until it was discovered on Google Earth off the coast of Costa Verde, Mexico. Most of these anomalies are artifacts of Google's ocean floor mapping process. For example, there was this supposed circular object found that some people thought was yet another sunken UFO, although it was just a data artifact created by how Google Earth stitches together multiple different data sources to roughly map the topography of the ocean. Another commonly cited anomaly are gridded areas that are mistaken for underwater cities and structures, but these were actually created by the ships taking the sonar readings, and the lines are a remnant of the past taken by these ships. And just to bring it up, there are also blurred out areas of the ocean on Google Earth that aren't very hard to find. Google Earth does blur out some sensitive locations like military bases, but this is most likely a side effect of Google Earth using different sonar and satellite images, some of which are much lower res than others. A couple years ago, a redditor found this void-looking thing, which turned out to be Vostok Island, a small forested island in the Pacific. Some speculate that the image on Google Earth is deliberately altered or censored, but taking a closer look at it on Google Earth myself, you can see that there is more detail to its forest. And as I just stated, whenever Google censors something, they blur it. 
The void was most likely a rendering error. On Google Earth in 2012, there was an island in the South Pacific called Sandy Island. But if you were to actually try and visit the island, you would find nothing but open ocean. It's been removed since, but it just goes to show that Phantom Islands can still be a thing, even in the modern era. Aggressive Magnapinna Squid A few months after I uploaded the first Aquatic Anomalies, this ROV footage of a Magnapinna Squid was captured. Previously, I talked about how Magnapinna Squids are thought to be passive hunters, lazily floating around and allowing their filaments to catch small prey. But some say this new footage shows the squid displaying more aggressive tendencies, seeming to attack the ROV filming it. Some say that this is proof that the Magnapinna squid is a more active hunter. Others think that its behavior is a reaction to the ROV filming it. I think I also lean a little more to the latter conclusion. In my opinion, it looks like the squid is trying to swim away from the ROV rather than attack it. These creatures certainly have natural predators, so of course they need to be able to move quickly to survive when threatened. I think its movements could also be trying to intimidate or disorient whatever's chasing it, but I'm really not sure, so take that with a grain of salt. Whether it's attacking or fleeing, it is cool to have footage that gives some insight on the different behaviors of the Magnapinna squid. North Sentinel Island In a world where humanity is more interconnected than ever, and there seemingly isn't any corner of the globe where human beings don't exist, it's easy to assume that all civilizations live in some level of modernity. Well, that isn't the case for the Sentinelese, a tribe of indigenous people from North Sentinel Island who have always existed in voluntary isolation from the rest of the world. North Sentinel Island is located in the Bay of Bengal, and in 1956 the government of India declared it a tribal reserve and prohibited any travel within three nautical miles of it to protect the Sentinelese people from mainland diseases. Not only that, but the Sentinelese have attacked outsiders before. They've been known to shoot arrows at boats and low-flying planes and helicopters around the island. So the surrounding area is patrolled by the Indian Navy to preserve and respect the islanders' desire to be left alone. Forgotten North American Sea On old maps of North America, there used to be a sea in the northern part of the continent that turned out to not exist. This sea was believed to be real by geographers and explorers in the 18th and early 19th centuries, who learned about it from second-hand accounts of Native Americans. This myth was corroborated on maps in hopes that it would spark efforts to explore the region and hopefully find a water passage through the continent. Beebe's Other Untouchable Fish Many have pointed out that the untouchable fish described by naturalist William Beebe bears a striking resemblance to the dragonfish with its jagged teeth, slender body, and lure hanging from its chin. But the creature that Beebe says he saw was far larger than a regular dragonfish. A dragonfish grows to be about 20 inches maximum, while the ones that Beebe saw were 6 feet long. Beebe himself knew about the similarities to the dragonfish, so he theorized that these could be from an entirely unknown family of dragonfish. Although, it is a possibility that Beebe had seen some regular dragonfish and mistook them to be larger than they actually were. Perhaps two dragonfish were swimming close enough together to be mistaken for a larger animal in the dark environment that Beebe observed them in. And the fact that Beebe has been the only person to see a dragonfish of this size supports this explanation. But the giant dragonfish wasn't the only abyssal fish that he believed to have discovered on his and Otis Barton's journey. There was the abyssal rainbow gar, a small blue and yellow slender fish with long, sharply pointed jaws that he believed to be related to the needlefish. And there was the pallid sailfin, a two foot long fish with vertical sail like fins. This one he actually saw multiple times. Another one was the five lined constellation fish, an almost circular fish that was five by six inches, with large eyes and five lines of bioluminescent yellow lights across its body. He claimed to see a whole school of them, and speculated that they might be related to the butterfly fish or the surgeon fish. Skeptics believed that he might have seen a comb jelly instead. And the last untouchable fish that Beebe described was the three-starred anglerfish. A six-inch anglerfish that had three lures, each tipped with a pale yellow light. It also had short and even teeth that differed from a typical anglerfish. All of his written descriptions of these fish were verified by Otis Barton, but they haven't been seen since. Deep Star 4000 Fish 
Deep Star 4000 was a U.S. submarine designed by Jacques Cousteau and built in 1965 to study marine biology, geology, and the physical properties of the water column, and was used for multiple dives until it was retired in 1972. On one dive, the crew narrowly escaped tragedy when the ascent system and its backup failed when they were 3,500 feet below the surface. They had to hand pump hundreds of pounds of mercury ballast used for trim out of the craft so that they could rise. There is also a story that during a dive off the coast of California in 1966, the crew of the Deep Star 4000 spotted an absolutely massive fish about 25 to 40 feet in length. For reference, the Deep Star itself was only 18 feet long. Skeptics have brought forward the idea that the giant fish was actually a Pacific sleeper shark but the way that the creature was described has more in common with bony fish than with sharks. Most books propagating this tale have come under criticism for being more focused on entertainment value and being generally unreliable. USS Stein Squid The USS Stein was a US naval ship that was used in the 1970s and 80s. As a navy vessel, it wasn't used for anything really noteworthy. Until an incident in 1978, where it was attacked by an unidentified species of giant squid. One day the ship suddenly had an emergency when its radar system went unserviceable. They returned to port to examine the fault and found that the rubber coating of the ship's sonar dome was damaged by multiple cuts. These cuts contained remnants of sharp curved claws similar to those found on the rims of suction cups of the colossal squid. But these claws were even bigger than those of the colossal squid. How much bigger, you may ask? Well, it's estimated that a squid with teeth the size found on the ship would be 150 feet long. Whatever this creature was, it could be one of the largest, if not the largest, animal on the planet. Ningen meaning. So, funny story of mine. Shortly after I uploaded the first part of this iceberg, I was talking to a friend of mine who's deeply afraid of the ocean, and he told me about a nightmare that he had where he was floating out underwater in the middle of open ocean, and he saw giant creatures with human like arms and fish like tails that approached him. To which I responded, Oh, you, you mean like this? and sent him this image, which nearly gave him a heart attack from the shock. But anyway, I reassured him that it was a made-up cryptid from Japan called the Ningen. And he told me that the word Ningen in Japanese translates to human. So I guess in the original Japanese forum posts, these creatures were basically just referred to as underwater humanoids. And whoever brought the urban legend to English-speaking countries just decided to use the word Ningen as their name. Black Jelly Creature with Tiny Little Hands in the last video, I talked about some internet campfire story 4chan post about a creature called the Black Carpet. A massive siphonophore-like creature that slowly shifts around the ocean floor. It was one of the stories that I didn't expect to have very much basis in reality. Well, as it turns out, there is footage of a similar creature. This black jelly creature with tiny little hands, as the video calls it. So holy crap, 4chan was right all along? The Black Carpet is real? Well, not so fast. This creature is actually an Anipniastes eximia, otherwise known as the Headless Chicken Monster or the Swimming Sea Cucumber. As you've probably picked up by that last name, these sea cucumbers have developed web swimming fins on their bodies that they use to move to new feeding grounds and avoid predators. And the tiny little hands are small tentacles that they use to feed on sediments. Another cool fact about them is that they are semi-transparent, and their intestines can be seen after feeding. It's not a mile-wide blob that absorbs sharks, but it's still really cool regardless. Call of the Deep Explanations and Comparisons One thing that you guys had a lot to say about was the Call of the Deep. I shouldn't be surprised, as I said it was an interesting and vague concept that can be applied to a lot of things. And you did go and apply it to many things. For a quick refresher, The Call of the Deep was a story about how people are for some reason compelled to swim straight down into the ocean. 
Some of you likened it to Lovecraftian lore, with how people in the Call of Cthulhu are drawn to the Great Old One himself through their Cthulhu-related dreams. Which is also similar to how in the story The Shadow Over Innsmouth, people who are secretly Deep One hybrids are inexplicably compelled to live by the sea. Some compared the Call of the Deep to what some call the Call of the Void, a phenomenon where you have a strange impulse to do something self-destructive. For example, you know when you stand near a high ledge and for some reason you have an intrusive thought telling you to jump? That's the Call of the Void. Yeah, it's pretty easy to see the link between the two. I've never been scuba diving myself before. Fraud alert, I know. But I bet divers often experience that same kind of intrusive thought. What would happen if I just kept swimming down? But just because you have these thoughts doesn't mean that you will act on them. So what about the people that do swim downward for no reason? Well, some of you pointed out that they could be experiencing narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis is an altered state of consciousness, similar to drunkenness, that occurs while diving at depth. It's caused by the increased pressure's effects on the gases in your body. A few of you have even relayed personal experiences where somebody went under nitrogen narcosis and began swimming downward because they were high and disoriented. It's probably easy to confuse your up and down when in such a state. Nitrogen narcosis is often caused by another illness that arises while deep diving called the bends. The bends, also called decompression sickness, is caused by bubbles forming in your bloodstream. When a diver ascends to the surface too quickly, this causes nitrogen gas from the bloodstream to rapidly release. The amount of pain caused by this varies depending on the severity of the condition, but its name comes from how decompression often causes air bubbles to settle in joints which can cause people suffering from it to bend over in excruciating pain. Symptoms can vary depending on where the bubbles are located. And in its worst cases, the bends can even be fatal. Man, I'm gonna scare away so many people from diving with this video. Maybe even myself. But as long as you ascend at a rate of about 33 feet or 10 meters per minute or less, you should be fine. Umibozu Umibozu is a yokai or paranormal phenomenon from Japanese fishermen folklore. It is a sea spirit that appears to sailors on calm waters and demands to be given a barrel. Then it causes the water to quickly turn violent and proceeds to drown the sailors. The only way to escape an umibozu is to give it a bottomless barrel then sail away while it's confused. It's also said that they hate the smell of tobacco smoke. Smoke. Like with many creatures from folklore, they are said to change their appearance. Although my favorite appearance is that of a massive, shadowy humanoid figure because holy shit that's horrifying. But it also takes on the appearance of a more traditional sea monster or even as a human. Its name translates to sea monk because it's said to have a bald head that's reminiscent of a Buddhist monk. Luska. The Luska is a sea monster from Caribbean folklore said to exist in the region of the Blue Holes in the Bahamas. It's described as a massive half-shark, half-octopus chimera. They're said to grow from 75 feet to 250 feet, and can swim extremely fast, and thanks to its tentacles can even walk on land. In 1896, a globster known as the St. Augustine Monster washed ashore in Florida, and some thought it to be a Luska but it was later concluded to be a pile of whale blubber. Humboldt Squid On the last video, a commenter mentioned a story where a diver encountered a group of squids that change color to communicate. Sounds like another mysterious creepypasta, but I know for a fact that this happened. Multiple times as a matter of fact. There's even footage of people interacting with these squids. We've known about them for a long time. They're the most important squid for commercial fisheries. They're real. They're called Humboldt squids, or sometimes jumbo squids. They live in the Pacific, mostly near Chile and Peru, grow to be about six feet long, and are known to be aggressive. They're carnivorous and hunt cooperatively in shoals. And as stated earlier, they change their color between red and white to communicate with each other, although it's unknown exactly what they're communicating to each other. But the way they appear to reorder the patterns they use is almost like words in a sentence. Like the colossal squid, they possess barbed tentacle suckers to grab prey and eat it with their sharp beaks. These squids are also infamous for attacking divers and fishermen, 
so much so that they've earned the name Diablos Rojos from Mexican fishermen. They've been observed to attack unfamiliar objects such as cameras and basically anything with lights attached to it, but some research shows that they only act aggressive when feeding. They eat small fish, crustaceans, copepods, cephalopods, and sometimes even other Humboldt squids. Heracleon Heracleon, sometimes called Thonis Heracleon, was an ancient Egyptian port city located near the mouth of the Nile, and is the largest sunken city ever discovered. Over time, due to earthquakes, tsunamis, and rising sea levels, it was submerged in the ocean where it remained undisturbed for 1200 years. The remains of the city weren't rediscovered until the year 2000, and excavations are going on to this day. In its time, Heracleon was a place of international trade and religious practice. It contained grand temples, chapels, statues of various leaders and deities, and was where ceremonies were performed yearly in honor of the rebirth of Osiris, the Egyptian god of the dead. It's absolutely insane that a full city can disappear for centuries, hiding in obscurity beneath the waves, once believed to be a myth only to be discovered unexpectedly. Maritime Hallucinations Maritime hallucinations are, simply enough, hallucinations that people experience while at sea. Most of these hallucinations are associated with conditions like sleep deprivation or mental and emotional stress. In the extreme conditions of early sailing, reported hallucinations of dry land, sea monsters, and mermaids were common. Although one hallucination that is interestingly common is that of additional crewmates. While at sea and deprived of sleep, sailors often hallucinate other people aboard the ship to help them out. Sometimes these are people from their past, other times they are people they don't recognize. This suggests that there is a subconscious desire within humans for assistance and companionship. The Doldrums The Doldrums are an area near the equator where sailing ships often get stuck as there's no wind in their sails. Due to the intense heat from the sun near the equator, most air is forced up into the atmosphere. Because of all the air circulating upwards, sailboats can potentially get stuck moving nowhere in this area for weeks. This isn't really a problem in the modern era, but back when ships pretty much relied entirely on wind to travel across the ocean, this was potentially deadly. Combine this with the fact that the weather there can suddenly change from still waters to violent thunderstorms in a matter of seconds, and you've got an area with quite the reputation among sailors. Lake Baikal Moving away from salt water for a bit, Lake Baikal is a massive lake in Russia just north of the Mongolian border. What makes it special is that it's the largest, oldest, and deepest freshwater lake in the world at 25 million years old and 1700 meters deep. It's also very rich in biodiversity, hosting more than 1,000 species of plants and 2,500 species of animals that we currently know about. These include fish, sponges, snails, the Baikal seal, and crustaceans. About half the plants and animals found in Lake Baikal don't exist anywhere else on Earth. Because of the lake's depth and varied wildlife, there are many legends about mysterious things that are hidden within it. In 1977, a research submersible called Pisces 7 made a dive to the bottom of the lake. When the crew finished working, they turned off the external lights, only to find that the area was still illuminated by some unseen light source that hasn't been identified to this day. This ties in with urban legends of UFOs seen in and around the lake, and encounters with a supposed humanoid race referred to by some as the Lake Baikal Swimmers. On the mythological side, there's the Lusud Khan, or roughly translated as Water Master. It's described as a giant sturgeon that originates from an old Mongolian legend about a hero that chased a dragon to the island of Olkom in Lake Baikal. Some believe it to exist and that the legend was based off an ancient encounter with it, but this mostly comes from English mistranslations. There's also some online green text story about the area, and a guy's encounter with a rare jellyfish that can crawl on land and has a potent poison that causes the human body to turn pale and its eyes and blood vessels to turn a dark gray. The green text also talks about the lake actually being twice as deep with a false bottom of brine that we think is the real bottom, it containing gigantic jellyfish larger than the blue whale, living specimens of extinct species, swimming whale skeletons that are given the illusion of life by a colony of microorganisms, and a theory about the Lusud Khan that I won't spoil. 
It's very much a creepypasta, but I talked about far-fetched stuff before, and some people wanted me to cover it, so why not? There's a link in the description if you'd like to read the story for yourself. And with that, we're at the end of the video. There are many things I covered in this video and the last, but combining the two together, I still haven't run out of things to talk about. I could make like 10 of these, and it wouldn't even make a scratch on the amount of interesting facts, theories, and stories about the ocean. Many of the things I talked about are probably fake, but just the fact that we are still telling tall tales about sea monsters that have a tinge of plausibility to them, just due to how little we still relatively know about the ocean, illustrates my point further. And I'm glad that so many other people share an interest in this stuff. I just want to take a quick moment to thank everybody again for watching. It's seriously mind-blowing seeing something that was a total left turn for me suddenly blow up and become easily the most popular thing I've ever made in just a matter of weeks. Almost everything in this video was a suggestion made in the comments of the last video. So I literally couldn't have made this without contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. But anyway, I'm planning on making more content similar to this in the future. Probably not another iceberg video for a while though. I don't just want this channel to be chasing trends. But if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing, there's a three-part ocean mystery iceberg by the channel Psychopoly that I'd recommend. He talks about some of what I've already talked about, but there's still a lot more stuff in his videos that I didn't cover. I also do have another video in the works that's within this same subject, so stay tuned. Hopefully by then I'll learn how to mix my audio properly. <laughs>